I lived with this constant sense of, I don't belong. Hmm. It created all this pain. And I just started reinforcing what I know to be true, that God says I belong, that I'm his son, that Jesus loves me. He demonstrated that on the cross. I experienced a, a pain that then I went back to what I know to be true and I was fighting against those lies that were so reinforced for so many years and so many different experiences. Welcome to Praise on TBN. I'm super excited to have you here and to answer some of our YouTube audience most pressing questions in relation to mental health, spiritual health, emotional health. And one of the questions we get a lot is where, if anywhere, does science come into play? Does science, and specifically neuroscience, does it corroborate what Scripture says about our emotional well-being? Does it negate it? And yeah, we want to bring you on here to talk about this. Yeah, you know, I had those very same questions when I was working on my dissertation. I wanted to write something that, and produce a model, if you will, of our transformation. I had a, a lot of training and background in psychology, so I knew that, that there was a part of emotional healing and mental health. And, and then I had the theology part, right? Sure. Just from seminary and being a pastor for all, for 25 years. But the more I kept going back to scripture, the more I saw this emphasis on our thinking. Yeah. A couple examples, like Paul in Romans 4, 8 says, you know, whatever is good, pure, true, lovely, anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Uh, Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewing yeah. of your mind. Uh, Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things above. Yeah. And on and on it, it, it went. And I started to think, okay, there's a connection here with what we think about. Why is that? Cause I, I don't have, I'm not a neuroscientist. I didn't know enough to be dangerous, but <laughs> you know, so I started re doing research in that area and come to find out it's like, wow, what neuroscience is telling us is in direct alignment with the process of transformation. Mm. And why wouldn't it be? Yeah. Right? Because God's fingerprints are all over this, this, this world. And we know from Romans 1, where Paul talks about through the creation account, even his divine attributes are clearly yeah. seen. Laid. So, you know, David talks about, you know, this, the stars are an expression of God's majesty and he knows everyone by name. And so there's lots of, you know, inference, if you will, to science. But as I started exploring more and more the aspects of neuroplasticity specifically, I started recognizing that, wait, there's something here yeah. that needs to be explored and then written about to help inform us in our discipleship to Jesus in our transformation. Yeah. Well, and I'll give you my very, very layman's uh, definition of neuroplasticity, and you can <laughs> you can teach me and correct me. But my, my, again, basic understanding of it is that sometimes we think the way I am, the way I think, it's stagnant, it's static, I can't change it, it, ca it can't be changed. But what the study of neuroplasticity has revealed is that you actually can change the way you think. Uh, that over time, you can adjust thought patterns and processes. And the whole point here is that what happens internally leaks out externally. It affects our relationships, uh, our, our lives, and to your point, the quality of our lives. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, what you discovered when you kind of started studying neuroscience and how it corroborates scripture? Yeah. Well, first of all, your understanding of neuroplasticity is spot. Okay. <laughs> so check. A plus. So good job. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and it, it, you know, how typically you'll say, well, it's not brain science, right? You, that's like, yeah. uh, it's too hard to understand, yeah. but it really isn't that difficult. So the un neuroplasticity is just the brain continues to change. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago where scientists really thought that at a certain developmental point, your brain stops changing. It's kind of, it's kind of like cement, right? If you let cement set, then you're done. You yeah. can't, you can't alter it. But what they've discovered is that our environment, how we think about things, how we process things, what we think about actually creates neurons in our brain. And so it's pretty fascinating that you can actually create matter by like your thoughts. Thought. Wow. Yeah. So God has created the brain to work in such a way that whatever we think about, we move toward. Yeah. So 
And that was a, a, a guy named Donald Hebb. He was a Canadian psychologist in 1949. He came up with what we know today as Hebb's Law, which has this phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together, yeah. right? So you've heard yeah. So the idea is that the more you focus on something, the more you think a thought over and over and over again, they call that attention density, hmm. the stronger that connection between those neurons becomes to the point where that becomes your default hmm. thought. And when you think about scripture, that's what biblical meditation is all about, right? That's what memorizing scripture does, yeah. is you're laying down neural pathways yeah of God's truth. And as you are doing that, that then becomes your default way of thinking about whatever the situation is. So there's even spiritual disciplines that neuroscience in, helps to inform us. Why does that work? Why does memorizing scripture such an important thing? Why is meditating on scripture such a big deal? Well, because of what we know from neuroscience. Mm. You had this great analogy in your book with regard to a gear and I, th I think it was what thoughts, will, and emotions. Yeah. Can you explain how that works? Yeah. So as I, as I was studying the word for heart, right? The word heart is used a thousand times in scripture. It's a big deal. There are three dynamics consistent from Genesis to Revelation. When you're talking about the heart, there's three dynamics and you mentioned them, thought, emotion, and will. I illustrated that by having three gears in the heart. And when one turns, it influences the other. Now for the engineers that are watching this, they're going, yeah, Ken, well, that's really nice, but three gears don't work. You need a fourth gear. We'll come back to that. So you guys just chill for a second. Okay. Thought and emotion always go together. Hmm. You cannot control your thoughts directly. You can control them indirectly by what you choose to think about. So you can't just say, I'm ecstatically happy right now, yeah. right? And that'd be legitimate. But as you are thinking, maybe having a, a thinking about a happy memory or being with somebody or whatever, it creates that sense of, of happiness, mm. of, of joy. And then our will. So think of your will as the decision making process. Now, Willpower, you can control willpower directly for a short period. I was going to say to an extent. Right. Yeah. But just think about your last New Year's yeah. resolution, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about mine right now. They didn't last very long. <laughs> so willpower is okay, but it's unsustainable over right. the long haul. I liken it to trying to hold a beach ball underwater. You're going to get tired eventually, let go, and it's going to rocket to the surface. But the one gear that we do have control over, that God gave us the free will to control, is our thinking. Hmm. So... We are not slaves to our thoughts. Mm. I think this is what Paul is getting to in 2 Corinthians when he's talking about uh, taking every thought captive, yeah. 2 Corinthians 10.5. It's almost like he's saying, take what is what you know to be true from Scripture and hold up the lie or distortion and compare those two. And then you have a choice. Which are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what God says is true? Or are you going to believe the lies and distortions of the enemy. So there's no conflict. I don't see any conflict with neuroscience in regard to our transformation process. Mm. I, I'm, I'm, I wonder if, if some people might be thinking, well, wait a second, are you saying then that we're, we're not responsible for our decisions because it's just our brain? Mm. So now we're not saying the devil made me do it. Now we're saying the brain made me do it. No, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that the problem is not the behavior. Yeah. That's a problem. The problem is what's going the on root. in the heart. You mentioned something in your book, uh, and you said, my decisions were more the result of a broken heart, not a rebellious spirit. And then later on, you said, behavior is a direct result of what's going on in the heart. And this is kind of partially what I, why I love that we're talking about this because the, the behavior is so outward. So it's so easy to identify that as the issue. But what you're saying is no, biblically and in every way, going back to the root of it is, is the crux of it. Yes. Yeah. So the, again, we tend to focus on behavior. So let's go back to Heb's law. Yeah. Whatever you focus on is what you're going to move yeah. toward. That does not resolve it. Mm. What resolves it is getting at what is it that's driving the behavior. Yeah. So, our thinking influences our emotions that influence our will that then produce the behavior. Okay, so we got to go back. We got to unpack the fourth gear real quick. The fourth gear is what uh, is in the book. I talk about it as uh, revelation or lies. 
we can either choose to believe, if we allow, let me say it this way, if we allow God's revelation to inform our thinking, that's gonna produce a different kind of emotion that's gonna affect our will, which is gonna produce different- Outcome. Outcome, yeah. exactly. If I'm choosing to believe Satan's lies or distortions about who God is, that's gonna create a whole nother set of emotions. Mm. That's gonna affect my will, which is gonna produce a different outcome. So again, it's not quite this simple. I'm being a little simplistic, but just stay, stick with me here for a second. It does illustrate the fact that our thinking is vital to our, and is part of a significant part of our transformation into the image of Christ. It's not everything, but it's a big part of that. Yeah. So in, in getting back to how does, you know, does neuroscience inform us in this way? Is, is there any conflict here? I don't, I don't see it as a problem. I see it as really helpful. Well, actually. yeah, it actually really supports exactly what the Lord has said, yeah. which makes sense. I mean, I've always sort of felt like there, there has to be a reason scripture says certain things, like that we are to be transformed how by the renewing of our mind, mm -hmm. um, that we are to take thoughts captive. I've heard people engage in these kinds of conversations before. And I just wonder what would you say? What would you say to people who think that's like, it's lip service? Like, I just need to control my thinking. And then, I mean, what we're talking about is actually, it really impacts the rest of it because that thought process is almost ignites a chain reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Biblically informed thoughts. Maybe we need to even be more Clarify. specific. Because God's word is supernatural, right? It's the living word of God. So there is something about God's word yeah. that is supernatural and that the Holy Spirit is engaged in that process. So maybe, Christina, it's like this, that I, I read that God loves me, but I may not feel like God loves yeah. me, but I know that this is true, so why am I not feeling it? What's, where's the disconnect? But what we know to be true is that God does love us because he says he does so in his word. Jesus demonstrated that as clearly as dying on the cross. Paul in Romans 5, 5 tells us that the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God into our hearts. We know that when we are with other believers, that we are, in essence, conduits of God's love, grace, and mercy to one another. That's one of our opportunities as a, a priesthood of believers. And, uh, and then just through others, just through our close relationships with others. So it's a multifaceted way of internalizing God's love. It's not just what we're thinking. But I'm going into the rest of that because I, I want us to see that it's an important part of that. Well, and it sounds like at some point the, through through that that repeated like meditating on the love of God for you, yes, or the love of God for me. I'll just right. personalize it. The more that I meditate on God's love for me, the more that I we talked backstage about basking in God's love. Yeah. But what I'm understanding is that the thinking is going to begin to produce emotions, yeah. and it's going to produce will, and that's going to lead to action that's in line with what I'm believing. Yes, and in line with the will of God. Yeah. Okay, so let me illustrate this from my life as as recent as yesterday. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm excited. There we go. All right. <laughs> So, so yesterday, my wife, <clears throat> Susan, and I had uh, our first session with a new coach. Okay. And that's what I do. I, I coach guys in discipleship and pastoral counseling and all that kind of stuff. And I just say, yeah, I probably need that too. So, <laughs> um, he, I got blindsided. I mm. got, it, it was, un I mean, I did not go in there thinking I was going to get wrecked and I got wrecked. But here, here's how it pertains to what we're talking about. When I was, when I was young, I was really badly bullied. Uh, I lived in Utah, Southern Utah, for three and a half years on my uh, mom and stepdad's ranch with my grandparents. And during that time, I never felt like I belonged. I mm. never was. I never had a group of friends. I was the. I was an outcast. Mm. I didn't fit into all the things that they thought I should fit into. Then leaving there, going to high school, I wasn't accepted in high school. I, and so I lived with this constant sense of, I don't belong. Hmm. Um, there's something wrong with me. Why, why don't I have this huge group of friends? And it created all this pain. So then in 2014, I was terminated from my job as senior pastor because the elders just felt like I didn't have what it took to take the church to the next level. And the way that it, that went about triggered all of this bullying, all of this, you don't belong here. 
this isn't this isn't the right place for you. And it just wrecked me. It I, unearthed I had never connected the dots in that huh. direction. And so I'm this morning, right, as I was getting ready for our shoot today, yes. I'm sitting there doing some journaling. I just started reinforcing what I know to be true, that God says I belong, that I'm his son. Christina, you're his daughter. Mm -hmm. You're one in whom Christ dwells, as am I. That Jesus loves me. He demonstrated that on the cross. And I, I, I was doing what I'm telling everybody else to do, right? <laughs> I am affirming my identity yeah. in Christ. I'm going over this. And when Susan and I were driving back from uh, seeing him yes, uh, after having dinner last night, as I was driving, she, she, she said to me, she said, what are you thinking? And I said, I don't know. I feel like something has shifted inside of me. Hmm. Uh, maybe it's too soon to say, but something happens. I know something happened because the dots connected and all of a sudden there was a floodgate of tears that I was not, I was guarded against, but it just, it just ambushed me. <laughs> and so I just, I think I experienced a, a pain that then I went back to what I know to be true and I was fighting against those lies that were so reinforced for so many years and so many different yeah. experiences. Sometimes I feel like that the enemy knows exactly what your preconceived distortions would be, exactly where to get you. And same with me. I mean, do, you, do you feel like that's true? I, I believe spiritual warfare is a real thing. Yeah. And I think Satan has been around for thousands of years. He can only be in one place at one time because he's a created being, but he's got lots of minions. Yeah. So uh, I don't think I'm important enough for Satan himself to be messing <laughs> with me, but he's, he's probably got a couple of privates that are, yeah. that are, that are bugging me. But yeah, we know because even, even going back to John 10, 10, where Jesus says, I've come to give them life right before that, he says, thief the thief comes. comes to steal, kill yeah. and destroy. And so that's his MO. Yeah. And of course, he's going to look for a weakness to exploit. And he's been studying human behavior for thousands of years, right? So it's not rocket science to him as to, you know, Ken's been bullied his whole life, so he's going to be vulnerable to In feeling... This area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's always where the enemy is going to attack. He's always going to attack us at our weakest point, at where the chink is in the armor. And that's why it's so important that we take this mental health conversation seriously and why we really think, you know, critically about how we grow in Christ and how we heal and how we resolve these, unre these uh, emotional issues and that kind of stuff, because they will ambush us at the wrong time in the wrong place <laughs> and it's not going to be pretty. Mm. Well, Ken, I wonder if you would mind praying for people who are listening who, again, can feel like they can relate to this conversation or or even feel like, I, I want to be strengthened in the thoughts that I think. I want them to be uh, God-oriented or I want them to be true in terms of who I am in Christ, my identity. People who really feel like, I, I mean, I, I need prayer and I, I want to start somewhere. Would you pray for those people? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Father, even as Christina was asking me to pray, Psalm 139 flashed in my mind. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have, you have created us with such intricacy and such, it's just a wonder. The brain is a wonder. How memory works is a, an amazing thing. And uh, Lord, it's so easy to get wounded in this life. And that create distortions that lead to faulty thinking that wreaks havoc. And so, Lord, would you give us the courage to challenge those distorted thoughts with your truth? Would you give us a greater desire to, to study and to read and to learn and to uh, dive into your word, which certainly can be hard and confusing at times, but Lord, would you give us a greater desire and love for your word, that we might hide it in our hearts so that we are not vulnerable to the lies and the distortions and the attacks of the enemy? Lord, thank you for giving us the resources that you have in your word. It is the living and active word of God. And it is a wonder in and of itself. And so may we apply that to our lives. And would, would you, Holy Spirit, uh, affirm and confirm the truths that are in the word so that we can not only believe those, but we can start living them out in ways that produce a different quality of life. Sure. And so that I pray all of that in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.